heard this noise like a almost like a train or a, or a large truck and then um, a lar huge cloud of smoke um, smoke and dust and debris the the dust became so thick that you couldn't see anything and uh, there was a police officer at the um, entrance to a building that was he was pulling people in so I went into the lobby of that building and um, it, it just became black outside like like night um, and there was a uh, maybe a half a minute after I went in the lobby um, this woman comes in who's just completely covered in dust That was the one frame of her that I shot. It, was, it wasn't this case where I had a lot of time to, to react or anything. And um, I remember looking at it later and seeing how well she was dressed. To me, it was interesting because she is looking right at me and right at you, the viewer. My parents were a little puzzled by, I think they were a little puzzled by the career choice because um, it seemed a little out of the ordinary that a lot of my classmates both in high school and college were doing, I guess what you consider more normal jobs. <laughs> uh, but they were, they were supportive since they, they always would say, uh, find something that you really want to do or you like to do and, and do that. They, they, they never tried to force us into doing um, any sort of career that, that we weren't really interested in. I actually built a little dark room in, um, or temporary one that I could put up and take down in, in our garage. And um, yeah, I could only develop things at night because um, there was, uh, during the day, too much light would leak in through the windows. But at night it was okay because you could just put tape and cardboard over the windows and that would that would shut out pretty much all, all the light. But it's a pretty rudimentary dark room. I, I'm always, when I think about it, I'm always amazed that anything ever came out of that. Uh, uh, but that was fun. I think people, I think it was interesting because I was able to produce these prints in the in the dark room. I guess part of photography is that you, you, you're sort of actually making these images, objects on the on, on paper and then you could look at them and it's sort of to me it was always amazing that anything ever ever actually came out like you like you had envisioned it in, in your mind. It started out that I actually wasn't gonna do much work that day. I was um, still doing freelance work. One of the other photographers called me um, early in the morning and he said that he had just seen on the news that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. I live in Manhattan and he lives in Brooklyn, so we were probably two of the closest people. I went down, on the, actually on the subway, and, and got down pretty quickly to the area around the financial district. When I got out of the subway, there were both of the towers were uh, burning. I had missed the, the second plane that had crashed into the, the second tower. I went south toward where the towers are and um, and then I saw lots of people heading in the opposite direction away away from the um, away from the towers I 
when you're photographing things, you're concentrating so much that a lot of times you're just not, sometimes you're not aware or, or you're not really thinking. I think if you think and try to analyze what's happening, you miss the shot or you, you, you break your concentration. I didn't really feel frightened at any point. I think in, until in the bank, some people came in that they weren't doing well at all. They were they were breaking down, and they they um, they didn't they were as frightened as anybody else. They didn't know what was going on, and I think at that point I realized this is a, a lot bigger than I ever thought it was. It was very still, uh, very quiet after this had happened. You you could hear occasional sirens of fire trucks or police cars a distance away, but with everything covered with this dust um, and you, you people would emerge who were covered as well and, and they were they looked like they had just been beaten down and they're just trying to come out um, like the businessman just trying to kind of get out as quickly and as safely as they can. And then later on we were looking at the picture and, and I had noticed that he was still carrying a briefcase. And I thought after escaping from the Trade Center and then walking however long he walked, he's, he's still clutching his briefcase. I, I thought that was pretty amazing. A Fortune magazine used that on their cover and um, everybody was trying to find out who he was also. And I, th I think a few days after the magazine came out, um, he called the magazine and said, that's me on your cover. Fortune called me and said, can you photograph this guy? Because they wanted to do um, an article about him. And so I went to his house in New Jersey. Uh, turns out he's a financial um, consultant, owns a, his own business. And he just happened to be a, in one of the Trade Center towers that morning. He and his son had cleaned his suit, and he had cleaned the briefcase, so I photographed him in the same suit um, with the briefcase. His name is Ed Fine. He has a really good memory of what had happened, and he wrote it down because he said he wanted to remember it and pass it on to his children and grandchildren almost like a stream of consciousness. He's telling you where he is, and it's, it's getting hot, and, and all this smoke, and he sees fire, so. And he, he's, he was on the 89th floor, I think, of one of the buildings, so he's, he walks down 89 flights of stairs, and out, finally out on the street. And as he's out on the street, the first tower collapses. Marcy Borders it started to get a lot of media attention because people found out who she was. So we ended up doing an interview with her. She lived in New Jersey and after September 11th, she, she didn't want to come back into Manhattan. That, that was interesting to um, to see that she was okay, and she didn't suffer physically any 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 damage, because um, it's rare you actually meet up with the subjects of your photos from a from a disaster like this. Pretty much for the next, I don't know, two months, that was the only story around. It seemed like every day there was something. Uh, the first week was pretty intense because people were still trying to make sense of it all and re recover. And then um, every, after that, say about once a week, there'd be some major event happening.
they lit these two beams of light to represent the, the, the Twin Towers. And, um, and this was um, in March of 2002, the uh, six month anniversary. And then my assignment was to go to New Jersey to try to work the Statue of Liberty into the photo. So I went out and drove around and found a great spot. And there was a couple other photographers, but then as, as, as the day went on, uh, this whole area filled up with about 20 photographers. So at first I thought, well, we had a pretty unique shot, and then, but then everybody else showed up. <laughs> People had been talking about rounding up Arabs and just like they did the Japanese in World War II. I think there, there were some talk shows that were talking about that. And I think on two, twice they heard people say, well, maybe it wa that wasn't so bad what they did to the Japanese or, or maybe rounding up Arabs isn't such a bad idea. And they were pretty shocked at what they were hearing that people would even think about something like that um, in 2001 knowing that 50 years ago this happened to a whole group of people and that, that it was and it is unconstitutional to do something like this. The hysteria during World War II caused the incarceration of 120,000 people of Japanese descent and this unfortunately uh, terrorism by small groups of, of men of Arabic background are causing um, in some cases, deaths of, to, to people that aren't even of Arabic background. Sikh Americans were attacked and sometimes killed in, uh, after the September 11th attacks. This is going to be bad for Arab Americans, um, much like an attack on Pearl Harbor was very bad for Japanese Americans and for my parents in particular that especially just my father alive now he he knows what it's like since he lived through something like that. Both my parents were born in California and my father in the San Diego area um, and my mother in Orange County. Coincidentally both families were sent to um, the Poston camp um, and then they didn't meet until after the war, until, um, um, because my mother's family after the war relocated to the San Diego area. And my father, um, after the war became a gardener, um, and now he's, well, semi-retired living in a, in a senior citizen's complex. I think I've always been interested in the camps because our parents talked about it a lot um, when we were small, which I think was unusual for a lot of Japanese American families. Um, at big gatherings, Thanksgiving and Christmas, the aunts and uncles and my parents would sit around and they would talk about what they would did in camp. Because um, my mother was still in high school, so she was uh, she graduated from high school in the camp. We learned definitely learned a lot more from the family than we ever did in schools. I've always wanted to try to do something photographically with that, documenting um, either survivors or somehow uh, the camps themselves. Um, my uh, older sister uh, and her partner and I decided we'd like to visit the site of all ten camps. You get a little bit of idea of the scope of the size of these of a lot of the camps. I think especially Poston, which I think had almost 10,000 people, um, which made it a small city in, in Arizona. see the site 
And you kind of try, you try to imagine rows and rows of barracks. And you realize that um, the conditions just were pretty harsh for anybody. Our Washington office had asked the group of photographers in the U.S. for volunteers to go. W would you be interested in going and going for six to eight weeks to cover, help cover the story in Iraq? And and um, I said yes. I thought it was this is a, this is the huge story of of this year. And um, I also thought uh, since the war is over, it's safer. Uh, that's what people said. <laughs> There wasn't the intensity that was happening when, when the war was happening. So at the very end of June, another photographer, American photographer, went and then he came home and I re replaced him. I'm glad I went. It was uh, a very intense assignment because we were working every single day. There were no days off. And when I left, it was 120 degrees, and so working under those conditions is, is pretty grueling and hard on your body, hard on the equipment. Every day there would be some sort of crisis happening somewhere in Iraq, and, and we would try to get to it no matter where, where we were. I would travel outside of Baghdad a lot to do um, stories in the other cities, but also stories with some of the American soldiers, and they would say, well, it, do you feel in danger in, in Baghdad? Because Baghdad was where a lot of soldiers felt in danger. There were lots of attacks that were happening in Baghdad. And I said, I, I, I didn't feel in danger um, since I was a civilian. The soldiers were walking around basically with big targets on them because they were, they looked like they were soldiers. Although there were lots of instances where I was embedded with certain army units and so you'd be driving around with them and in that case you are, you're part of this moving target that's going around. Um, I suppose if I thought about it more, I, I might not have gone. <laughs> Probably the biggest thing that happened when I was there was Saddam Hussein's sons were killed, uh, Uday and Kusai, in a big battle in this northern town of Mosul, which is about four and a half hours drive uh, from Baghdad. And they were on this list that the military had of the top, I think, 55. They were numbered two and three, so these were two pretty big guys that they, that they got. The military allowed independent journalists to photograph the bodies of Uday and Kusai, so I ended up being the, the one still photographer allowed to, to photograph the bodies in the morgue. The conditions in Iraq and the conditions in some of the internment camps were probably fairly similar. There was uh, a lot of dust, and then I, I spent a lot of time with army units on their bases, and. Some of them were in these palaces, presidential palaces, but anywhere you went there was just um, dust all over the place, so you would get covered with it, your equipment, and so it was a matter of um, just trying to keep everything working and keeping, trying to keep healthy.
people are the real story for anything. Um, and so whenever you're, you come across interesting people, it's always, they always make for, for interesting stories, interesting photographs. The, the good thing about this job is that you, like I said, no, there is no average day or no typical day, so because every day is, is different, and, and you really get the opportunity to, to uh, see a lot and, and meet a lot of, of, of different kinds of people.